Next speaker is Dr Anna Sturrock, uh, who is a UK Research and Innovation Future Leaders Fellow uh, and Lecturer in Marine Ecology at the School of Life Sciences, University of Essex. Um, Anna is an aquatic ecologist with a particular interest in fish ecology, conservation and management. And uh, Anna primarily uses natural chemical tracers and growth increments in fish tissues uh, to reconstruct um, life history. So uh, we're going to hear uh, lots about that today. So uh, over to you, Anna. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me OK? Yeah, and loud and clear. You, great. And you're, and you're looking at the right screen, not the presenter room. Yeah. That's it. Perfect. OK, great. I've had so many issues with that. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Sturrock, as he said, and um, I will say that uh, my title did include Atlantic salmon, but I'm not talking about them that much. I'm actually giving you another North American perspective with the idea of how we can uh, uh, use the tools that we've developed in California over here in the UK. So. Anna, you've just accidentally gone on mute there. Oh, how weird. Sorry, I don't. I never use Teams, so I'm really I'm used to it. Sorry. Um, so I'm originally from the UK, but for the last eight and a half years, I've been living in California, working with Chinook salmon, and um, and just wanted to give you a bit of context. So I'm actually getting a PhD student soon to look at kind of how their life history strategies have evolved after they were translocated to New Zealand about 100 years ago. So that's kind of one side of what I do. But I'm also um, ah. I think my cut. Sorry about this. There we go. Um, and so but I'm also starting a new project uh, as of well, really January this year, um, working with Atlantic salmon, uh, UK and Irish populations, and then hopefully going to be starting collaborations soon. Um, also kind of looking at um, pink salmon migration patterns. So you might be thinking, what are we going to learn from California? It's a hugely different climate to the UK. Um, it's a Mediterranean climate, so you get these crazy drought years um, with wildfires and so on, and then incredible flood years. They've got these atmospheric rivers that just dump so much water there, and so you get lots of snow and, and flooding. But with climate change, we are seeing much more kind of extreme weather patterns in the UK. Um, and so I think we do need to be thinking about things like flood infrastructure and so on. And so some of the research that we've been doing in California might help us with this kind of making these changes in ways that are going to hopefully benefit salmon and other other fish. So the structure of this talk today, I'm going to be talking about um, basically eyes and ears of salmon and these kind of chemical traces. And so the first part will be looking at how we can reconstruct um, migration timing of juvenile salmon. Uh, using the otolith chemistry and thinking about how this ties into dam construction and flow management. Um, and then also thinking about off channel rearing using island traces and thinking about how all this links to lateral connectivity to these floodplain habitats and, and flood infrastructure. And then I'll end with thinking more about Atlantic salmon and future work in the UK. So California is a place of extremes in so many ways. Um, it's got uh, so much water infrastructure there. It's amazing because I, I guess you have to deal with these amazing kind of uh, flood years and drought years. Um, and so um, most of the rivers in the Central Valley have got these huge rim dams in them, which cut off that habitat to the upper upper river. So I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can, you, can anyone tell me if you can see my cursor moving around now? Yep. Uh, yeah? Yes, I can. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. OK, that, that helps. Um, so these blackened areas, I almost think they look like tarred lungs. Those are all the habitats that now diadromous fishes cannot access anymore. And so that's obviously changed lots of habitat loss, but also there was a historical overfishing. Potentially still might, people would, might say there's overfishing. Uh, there was the gold rush with lots of pollution, lots of habitat loss. And then today there's this huge booming agricultural business. And so unfortunately, there's often this fish versus farms kind of chat. And, um, you know, they say that we're wasting water for the fish. But um, then to just kind of counteract these kind of infrastructure uh, changes and habitat loss, they've got huge uh, salmon production hatcheries. So I want to say I should know this cover a paper on it about two million uh, smolts released every year. Um, but increasingly, um, they are trucking them to the estuary in these trucks and releasing them in the estuary. So 
obviously that results in those individuals not having smelt their way out to the ocean and so we have a lot of straying as well and I did a study looking at that with uh, coded wire tag recoveries but today I'm going to be focusing more on um, chemical traces but broadly speaking I'm interested in thinking about you know how can we kind of under better understand how habitat loss particularly on the freshwater landscape hatchery practices drought and flow modifications how they're going to impact salmon behavior growth and survival and I know there's a, a lot of chat about in the UK, you know, and Atlantic salmon, it, the mortality happening in the sea and, uh, you know, that the data does obviously suggest that. But if there are you know, actions we can take on the freshwater landscape to improve the chance of survival in the marine realm, then those are those are things we need to grasp, at, I think. So, um, as you all know, um, juvenile salmon have this amazing diversity in terms of life history strategies, moving through freshwater, leaving freshwater at a range of different sizes and times. And I kind of laugh showing this slide because in California, we're like, wow, you know, they leave it fry past multiple yearlings. But then, you know, they, they never leave after more than one year. Whereas I know that in the Atlantic salmon can stick around for like nine years. Right. And so it's quite funny. I mean, this probably doesn't look that diverse to you. Um, but uh, one thing is, unfortunately, because uh, yearlings obviously need to over summer and it gets so hot in California and we've cut off all that high elevation habitat, that yearling strategy is now very, very rare. And so one of the studies we did looking at rotary screw trap data, we showed how um, this kind of all this, uh, the, the loss of flows, the suppression of flows and the alteration of the shape of the hydrograph, so when the flows come, do really impact juvenile emigration timing and survival. So that's kind of one component. But today I wanted to think more about, you know, there's always this question, but who survives? And, you know, there's a lot of tagging work going on uh, both here and in California and, and, and lots of places in the world. But you just can't tag these newly emerged fry. And, you know, within, in, in Pacific salmon, you know, often the majority of the uh, of a given cohort will leave their river as kind of 35 millimeter fork length fry and you just can't tag them and so by using chemical traces in tissues it's almost like a, a kind of natural tag um, to track their survival so how we do that we have been typically sampling survivors and it, sometimes we sample the survivors and we sample them leaving fresh water sometimes we sample them at sea here we're sampling them as part of these carcass surveys so these are the ultimate survivors, they managed to make it all the way, you know, avoid the fishing boats and they come back to spawn. And because they're Pacific salmon, they all die after they spawn. And so they have these carcass surveys anyway, where they are, um, they mark and recapture the actual carcasses to kind of get an estimate of escapement size. And they take scales to look at cohort reconstructions. And then now we've been getting them to lop off the heads and take otoliths out for us as well. And increasingly now we're also asking them to pull the eyes out so they think we're super weird but um, we get really inf amazing information out of this. So I'm going to start with the ears, the otoliths. So these calcium carbonate ear stones, they're in the brains of the fish and they use them for keeping upright and for hearing um, and they grow like a tree trunk so you've got those growth bands in them and I, I'm not going to talk much about that today but that's another thing that you can do is look at growth rates in, in different time points in their life. Um, but the chemistry of them reflects the water they grew up in and in California, probably not so much in the UK, but within California, because you've got you know so much tectonic activity, you've got volcanoes and and uh, earthquakes and so on. You have these amazingly kind of varied rock uh, types across space, and so pretty much every watershed or catchment has its own unique isotopic fingerprint. So the strontium isotopes, 87 to 86, and we can use that as a marker of where that fish was born and when it moved through the system. To get to this map, this chemical map, the ice escape, does take quite a long time. Water sampling, using bivalve shells as passive markers, but you know you get this amazing kind of resource at the end of all that. And so we get the otolith out and we use a laser <laughs> to uh, reconstruct kind of movements at these kind of quite short temporal scales. So in this, because Chinook salmon grow quite fast, we can usually get about 10 day resolution with every spot analysis. And uh, depending with Atlantic salmon, it might be more like kind of 20, 20 days to 30 days per spot. We'll, we'll have to see, we're all doing all this at the moment. Um, so we've sampled across these growth rings to get this kind of full life history transect. Um, and then we, this, the, 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 the material gets passed through this called, it's called the ICPMS. And then we kind of measure the iron uh, ratio at the end of it, and then compare it to our map to say where that individual is from. And so 
here's an example in uh, of a single kind of what we call otolith strontium profile here. This is the data we get out at the end. This is a sectioned otolith, so this is where the fish was born and the core, and each of these spots is kind of what, we, this is the data we got out of it. And this is kind of our interpretation at the bottom. So here we can see this fry is using up the yolk and it's growing in the gravel at the moment. So the mum, these are full runs, so the mum made the yolk in the ocean, so it starts off as this kind of average oceanic signature. And it's emerged from the gravel and it's bang on the kind of average signature of the Stanislaus River, which is where the adult was from. And so you do get a lot of strays. It's not a given they're from that river, but this one was from that river. But it didn't stay in the Stanislaus River for long. It actually moved out to the San Joaquin River and stayed there for about six weeks or so to, um, to undergo smaltification and get big enough to go to the sea. And then it smolted and went to the ocean. <laughs> so that's an animation to show you kind of one fish's life history. But then each of these strands of spaghetti is basically an individual's life history, an adult that came back to spawn. And so you can do it on a population level. You can get this information at individual and population level. So it's really cool. Uh, so one of the things that was quite interesting here was with spring run, one run of salmon, they don't really seem to drop into different habitats like winter run do. Winter run are quite nomadic. They kind of go around, they go into the Latin tributaries up here, they go into the American River and the Feather River, and they're basically wandering around the system for multiple months and then before they go to the sea. Whereas spring run have this amazing kind of temporal uh, diversity. They either live, leave their rivers uh, as very small fry and rear in the freshwater delta, or they leave as smolts, or they leave as yearlings. And this was where it got kind of interesting with this particular study, because actually the majority of the adults that came back were that rare yearling strategy. And so it basically tells us that, you know, there's a really strong kind of survival benefit of leaving late. Basically growing slow in freshwater and leaving late can be a good thing. They are leaving in the fall rather than the spring, so there could be kind of other aspects about kind of um, the ocean at that point in time and, and prey availability too. But one of the kind of amazing things here was you see this what we call a portfolio effect, kind of the, the pattern varied among years. And what was really striking was the years when yearlings were the real ultimate survivors were all the years when um, the juveniles were rearing in extreme drought conditions. So basically our, our hypothesis is that when there's these extreme droughts, you know, it's a bad idea to try and leave in springtime because it's just so hot through that system and it's so degraded those waterways, so it's better to wait. Um, but I will say, um, one of the things we have to watch out for here in a lot of work is we're, we're sampling the survivors, we're looking at the adults, and we know there's obviously going to be potential for selective mortality along before that point. So we don't know whether the, the yearlings did well in those years, or maybe they all just left as yearlings. We, we don't know, and this is why it's really important to also sample the juveniles, so you can compare the same traits in the juveniles to the adults that came back, and then you can start saying, okay, was that a survival benefit? Or was it more difference in life history expression? And so it's a little bit like the kind of World War II aircraft. You know, they come back with all these bullet holes, and at first people were trying to, you know, thought we had to reinforce these areas. But actually, the important thing was to reinforce the parts of the plane where the planes weren't coming back with bullet holes there, because they're the ones that didn't make it. And so we almost need that, we don't have a blueprint for salmon juveniles because they do things differently every year. So by having a sample of juveniles and then comparing it with the adults, we can effectively say which ones didn't make it, which ones are doing really poorly in the ocean. That makes sense. OK. So now off channel habitat use, um, similar to here in the UK, um, there was a lot of wetland and floodplain habitat historically. But um, today, you know, about 95 percent of wetlands have been lost. Um, in California now, they have a series of really quite large kind of flood bypasses now, which are built purely to stop, you know, big cities from flooding. But actually, they function quite similarly to a floodplain. And if you take a beaker of water from a floodplain, an inundated floodplain versus the Sac River mainstem next to it, you see huge differences in the, in the, in the invertebrate um, kind of abundance. And and so when they've done some experiments with kind of putting juveniles onto these floodplains in kind of caging experiments and found that their growth rates are through the roof. And so there's now lots of nice synergies with you know, landowners trying to improve fish access to their, their farm fields. Um, and so, but one of the question marks is, you know, we're spending about billions changing the weirs to allow fish access, improve fish access onto them. But we don't really know if that's actually a good idea. Are fish actually still going to be using them? Does it have a survival benefit? And so here we're using the eye lens as a um, like a floodplain tracer or off-channel uh, habitat use tracer. And so the lens is that kind of little kind of 
sphere that is in the middle of the eye there and you can peel it just like an onion and instead of like an otolith is made of calcium carbonate like almost like a rock whereas an otolith uh, eye lens is more like protein and so it tells us what the fish has been eating basically i'm not going to go into the chemistry but the point is that flood plains have this depleted sulfur signature so now we've got a different marker but it tells us instead of like what water the fish was in it tells us what food web the fish was feeding in when it was a juvenile and so we're using this, so I'm, I'm battling through because I'm suddenly realising I'm out of time, um, but we're using this to uh, look at the kind of differences in uh, fish rearing in the mainstem river versus fish rearing in the, in the, on the floodplains of flood bypasses in this situation. And what we're finding in winter run are critically endangered on the Endangered Species Act. Everyone really cares about winter run. We're finding that you know, about half the population in a wet year are spending a lot of their juvenile rearing time in these kind of off-channel flood bypasses. So they're clearly really important. And I'm really excited because the next level will be then to look at the juveniles leaving, like I said before, and what proportion of them use those uh, off-channel habitats. Then look at the adults that come back from that same population and cohort. And then you can say, oh, wow, we've got this survival benefit. Or maybe it's not a survival benefit and it's just good for growth. But so far, the data is suggesting that it has a really strong impact on their ultimate survival in the ocean. So what's in store for the future? And now I've just got to thank so many people on this call um, because for the last sort of year, um, people have been collecting uh, kelp heads for me. Smelly work and I appreciate it so much. And so this is all going to be coming as part of a pilot study that happened last year with the Atlantic Salmon Trust and that's led into this Future Leaders Fellowship that I started last month. And so um, I'm in the process of hiring people to process all these samples, but ultimately we want to use them for a lots of different and interesting research questions. So first I'd like to say thank you particularly to Marcus Walters, who is the reason I'm here today and also the, basically the start of this entire project. And so initial results are looking interesting. I haven't got much data yet, but one of the cool things that I think you might be interested in the sea trout, um, well, sorry, the trout, um, the cause of the juvenile um, fry, basically are really seem to be very strong, good indicators of the maternal strategy. So whether they're resident or um, seafaring mothers. And so you can really start using that kind of data to understand the kind of relative um, productivity of those two different kind of uh, strategies. Um, but we can also get quite kind of um, detailed information about um, rearing histories of individuals in the freshwater phase in particular. And so here we've got a farmed fish in grey, we've got a uh, froom fish in uh, orange, and we've got a devron fish in kind of green. And what you can kind of see is that these wild fish, they, they went to the ocean about there. So we've got all of that data for that freshwater fearing, uh, rearing phase. And we also see quite a big difference in the kind of um, isotopic fingerprints of these different populations. So I'm hopeful that this combined with otolith chemistry might help to improve genetic assignments for say watersheds that are more genetically similar. Um, finally, yeah, we're also going to be looking at the biochronology, so the growth rates in different habitats, building and stuff we've been doing in California. Um, and then I'll be passing otoliths on to Nora Hansen at Marine Scotland, and she'll be looking at, you know, ocean movements and temperature histories using this Delta 18O marker. And then Clive Truman will be looking at field metabolic rates with carbon-13. And then we're in conversations about also potentially looking at pinks to see whether, you know, do they all really go out to the estuary very small and young or are some potentially in, uh, in competition with Atlantic salmon in the rivers. Um, also starting hopefully a project with Owen uh, O'Gorman. So I'm trying to link metabolic rates of salmon and trout to diet histories, survival rates and life history strategies. And then this kind of pile is going to get a postdoc quite soon to really kind of do some method development, trying to understand how well we can kind of get hormones and contaminants out of eye lenses and also potentially scales uh, with DG Brophy. So on that, I'd just like to say again, thank you very much for everyone who's helped already by collecting samples. If anyone's willing to kind of get on board and cut heads off kelts, please get in touch because obviously it's quite hard to get samples, not, not a popular thing to lethally sample a, a salmon. Um, uh, so kelts would be in you know, any kelp samples would be great, but long term it would be great if we could think about strategic sampling strategies, maybe getting some fish from um, like the Greenland fishery and, and some juveniles. So we can really start looking at this selective mortality events and so on. OK, I'm definitely out of time. So I'm going to say thank you to all of my collaborators and funders and um, everyone who's helped collect samples. And uh, yeah, with that, I'll take any questions if I have any time.